Merry Thanksgiving Eve to all of you who are in town. Uh, We're going to be looking at women's roles in the church. These Wednesday night classes have been dedicated to, first of all, understanding what does the Bible mean when it uses the word church? By the way, what does that word mean? Group of people. Uh, We're not going to do as much review as we have in previous classes Um, But we've talked about the differences between the local church and the universal church. The universal church being all the saved for all time. A local church is a group of people living in the same area that come together to try to strive to serve God uh, in in that context. Uh, And then classes 5 through 9 have been talking about the worship or activities of a local church, the Lord's Supper, why we don't use instruments, how we collect and use the church treasury... Tonight we're going to be dealing with women's roles, and um, we will talk about how it bears on the local church, but in this class we might scale back a little bit and just think maybe somewhat about our culture as well, but it'll it'll all funnel down into this topic of uh, women's roles in the church. The material is in the back, and um, I'm going to go off of the material for part of the class uh, because there's some things that on the material. You can go read that stuff. You can look at it yourself. You can ask me questions later. But there's some stuff that's not in the material that I want to make sure that we cover tonight. So if we don't get through all the PowerPoint slides or we don't get through all of the material, um, we'll be fine with that. Uh, So just remind us, the goals of these classes is to gain a biblical understanding of the church, to deepen our understanding of the collective activities that we do when we come together, and then encouraging the activation of your talents and so at every one of these classes is aiming at, at least on touching one of those goals, if not more than that. Um, the outline of what we're looking at tonight for women's roles is, first of all, dealing a little bit with our cultural context. We're not going to spend as much time as the material would show that we would. Um, and then the roles women do not have in the scripture, and then roles women do have in scripture, and then the concept that, that we are complementary but equal in value. And so on the material, I begin by asking about um, feminism and what feminism is, just to understand where we're at in our culture. And I'll just give you a couple quotes, just really briefly, just to understand our cultural context and where we live. But this quote um, says this, first wave feminism, which is the early 1900s to the late 1960s, could be divided into two groups labeled as the egalitarian feminists and the maternal feminists. Despite their differences, these two wings of feminism still managed to work together and their efforts opened doors for women to own property, attend universities, and run businesses. The first wave was, unfortunately, the last time these two groups worked together on a significant scale. All right, so first wave feminism, as this book describes it, came from the 1900s to the 1960s. Do you think it's okay that women can own property? All right, I I agree with that. Um... What about uh, um, uh, attending universities? Do you think that's okay? Yeah, I think so too. Uh, running businesses. Did it, was there any woman in the Bible that ran a business? Yeah, Lydia did. Um, so I don't think that there's any problems with those kinds of things. There's no problem with a woman being able to be financially taking care of herself because in order to be a good Christian, do you have to be married? No. So if our culture has allowed women to be able to financially take care of themselves because they, there's maybe they don't trust any guys that they would otherwise marry because he's not going to take care of her and she, she's got some issues with the pool of guys that, she, you know, whatever the reason might be, she's got the right to have that as, as her decision. So that's fine. But second wave feminism is described uh, in the following way here. The second wave beginning in the early 1960s and lasting about two decades expanded the idea of women's rights by arguing for so-called reproductive rights and reducing workplace inequalities. It was here that fissures within the movement began to show. Second wave feminists consistently downplayed the unique role of women in society and instead focused on the message of self-determination and autonomy. The egalitarian feminists grew increasingly radical and forged new ties with those who are who advocated leftist policies. Um, what this second wave of feminism, and and if you read books that talk about the history of feminism in the United States, they'll talk about first, second, and third wave uh, feminism. So this is common language that you'll read in in lots of different books. 
um, maybe parts of this that, that are good and you'd agree with and other parts of it that you can kind of see maybe aren't going in a good direction. Um, and that was a while ago that that movement ended according to this author. But So third wave feminism is described like this. The third wave started around the 18, 1980s and continues to this day. Third wave feminists believe only a complete transformation of society from the ground up will free women from their chains. Again, note the Marxist emphasis on total transformation. They believe that men, whether they realize it or not, are still part of a system of oppression that holds women down. And so this gets us to the more modern uh, form of feminism and not the traditional form of it. And I don't even mean to use that word in a derogatory kind of way, because uh, people can mean different things by when they say those words. So I'll just say extreme feminism or radical feminism is the idea that all men are oppressors and they just want power and women are held down by oppressive men. By the way, have there been oppressive men throughout history that have held people down, whatever gender they might be? Yeah, all of those things have existed, but um, does that mean that uh, authority that God maybe has given to men in the household and for our purposes in a local church setting? Is that some kind of systemically sinful thing that God has done? No. The problem always becomes the way people use their authority. And so because of the misuses of authority, there are people now that say that we have to have a radical transformation and, um, and it's only going to be satisfied when women are the ones that are in charge of men now and you get all this fighting and all of this sort of thing. And so I just bring up these quotes to show that this it shows the, the, the cultural context that we're in so that when we start looking at some of these passages in the Bible, they seem to be at direct collision with what a lot of people in our society hold to be valuable and important to them. And these passages in the scripture, I don't think are trying to be offensive in any way. God has ordered the, the things the way that he has. We have to respect what the scripture says, regardless of what our culture says about it. But we've got to understand these passages in the way that God wants us to understand them. And I just wanted to briefly go through that just to understand that if maybe you've never been here before or you're not a Christian or you're new to the Bible, some of what we might look at tonight may seem offensive. We don't have time in 45 minutes to talk about every single nuance to everything we're going to talk about tonight. So if anybody wants to talk afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that. I think everything that God says is for what is best for us. And there are some things that might not always make sense to us. And this might be one of those kinds of topics. But we've got to see what the Bible says about it. Does anybody have any comments or questions before we start looking at some of these roles in Scripture that, first of all, women do not have? Okay, um, so let's then go into this question. In, in the Bible, what are the roles that women are not given? Uh, and we'll say just generally speaking leadership. Uh, and you have some examples of this, like husbands, we'll talk, uh, there's passages that talk about husbands and wives submitting to their husbands, and we don't like that word submit, and, uh, but it's, it's not saying that the husband can abuse his power, again, all these nuances that we're not going to have time to get into right now, but the patriarchs in the Old Testament were like the leaders of their clans and households, the judges, with the exception of Deborah, and I think even the exception of Deborah, part of the point of that is that the men were not leading like they were supposed to, which created a vacuum, and then God almost, I think, is a way of shaming the men. Okay, I'll raise up Deborah to do this. Uh, the priests were all men. The kings were men. Uh, the apostles, elders, and shepherds, or pastors in a church are, are men. And so that's what God has done since Adam was created first and then Eve. Now, I went, this is where we're going to take a little bit of a detour from some of the material. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. And none of this is on the material that is in the handout. None of it's on the PowerPoint. But I want to bring up the two passages that oftentimes then get applied to the context of a local church. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. And um, I'm going to start towards the end of the chapter and then go back a little bit. But notice in verse 37, where Paul says, and, and by the way, this chapter is about a first century gathering of Christians, and the way that they would gather and the things that they would do probably look different from how we would do it today, but we have to, and there's certain things about this chapter that 
I don't fully understand how they did these things with miraculous abilities, but there's certain things that are clear in this chapter. Look at verse 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a commandment of the Lord. What do you think Paul's point there is in verse 37? Yeah, Amy? Yeah, like, it, 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 have you ever met somebody before who's like, well, well, I'm really gifted in, in such and such a way, so I should be able to do this, or I'm a very spiritual person, how dare you ever tell me that I couldn't do this or that for the Lord? And he says here, if anybody thinks that they're spiritual... Just acknowledge that whatever I'm writing to you is not my own opinion. It's not things that I contrived, but this is what the Lord has asked me to say. Now, go back a couple of verses to verse 34. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. All right, now that sounds very offensive. Uh, we just had a woman make a comment. Uh, and lots of women make comments. So what does he mean here in this context when he says for women to keep silent? There's a couple things that we could already eliminate. Are women commanded to speak in the assembly? In singing, right? In Ephesians 5, to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So in that context, women are part of when we sing. Um, does this mean that if a woman had, let's say, like a little three-year-old kid that was goofing off during an assembly, she couldn't lean over and say, hey, be quiet? Could she do that? Well, this text says that she's got to be silent. So what does this passage mean when it says to keep silent? Now, go, go back a few more verses and look at verse, um, let's start in verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at the most three and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. All right, so you got people who have the ability to speak in tongues, and there's no interpreter. When there's no interpreter for Mr. Tongue Speaker, what is Mr. Tongue Speaker supposed to do? Be quiet. What does that mean for him to be quiet in verse 28? Speaking in tongues and do not speak so as to lead the congregation. Don't speak in a way where you're like getting up or taking charge of, of the class or the sermon or whatever is going on. Don't speak so as to lead. Could that same guy in that assembly lead a prayer in whatever language the people all would know about? I think so, but with regards to your tongue speaking, you keep silent. Don't try to lead because nobody's going to be able to interpret. Now, keep going in verse 29. If two or three prophets speak, uh, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. All right. So this is one of those ones that's like, well, does this mean there's a couple of prophets waiting to talk and then somebody suddenly gets something else and he kind of gets to butt in line of the guys that are going to prophesy? I don't understand all of what maybe is going on there. But you've got a prophet and what's he told to do in verse 30? Keep silent. Again, keep silent so as to not lead in that context. So when women are told to keep silent in verse 34, in the context, what does he mean by keep silent? Don't lead. <clears throat> and so um, this is one of the passages that, that shows us, okay, women do not have the role in a public assembly, in a gathering of Christians, to lead that assembly. Um, does that mean that a woman can't make a comment in a Bible class? What do you think, women? I don't think that that means that you couldn't make a, a comment in a Bible class. You're not taking charge uh, you're not leading the, the, you might be, at, be adding some thoughts that are helpful to us, but that doesn't mean that you're leading the class or, or anything like that. Um, and the assembly, like the people that lead the Lord's Supper, the people that, uh, that preach and teach and lead songs and all that kind of stuff, what gender has God given that role to? 
to men. Okay, any comments or questions on 1 Corinthians 14? Yeah, in verse 34, so when it says if they want to learn anything, ask their husbands at home, does this mean that they were like rudely interrupting what was happening and asking questions that are better reserved for, because the manner that they were asking and and the context that they were asking in is better suited for not the assembly because you're kind of like interrupting everything? It's possible that that's what was happening there. Uh, The general principle would still be the case, though, that the leadership is not given there. Uh, Amy and then... Yes. Right. And that seems to be the kind of assembly that 1 Corinthians 14, is, there's a hymn, you know, there's these things going on. And what we're doing is like, if one of us had a house big enough to have a Bible study like this, would it be okay if we did it at our house on a Wednesday night? Like, yeah, yeah. This is not like the kind of assembly where we're taking the Lord's Supper and all that sort of thing. And so like, if we were comfortable in a house setting for women to make a comment, then like... Why would we be uncomfortable just because we're at the same building that we do take the Lord's Supper on on Sunday morning? We're doing something different right now than we do on a Sunday morning. So that's a good, fair point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and we're about to go to 1 Timothy. So any other comments or questions on 1 Corinthians 14? Yes. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, Are you asking where the law says that? All right, yeah. You guys realize that in verse 34 when he says uh, they should be in submission as the law also says, where does the law say that women can't speak in the assembly? Well, it doesn't really say that anywhere. I think he's saying that it's in accordance with the law, that Adam was created first and then Eve, and then you've got the priests that were the men and the patriarchs who were the leaders. It's in accordance with what the law says these principles are, I think is the idea. Yes. Yeah, easily taken out of context. And in fact, yes. Yeah, in the context, it's shameful for women to speak so as to lead or interrupt the service or something like that. That's not the rule given to women. Yeah. But if you just isolate that verse and not understand what he means by keep silent, keep silent, keep silent, then you can think that it's quite offensive. So, all right, let's go to 1 Timothy 2 and say a couple more things about some of these things. Um, as you're turning there, let me point out, because this is part of the next thing, is another thing that role, roles that women do not have is prayer and teaching in certain contexts. Um, some people will say that in 1 Timothy, he's dealing only with things that happen in the assembly. And um, I don't know that I would want to go that far because of, like, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Is that only when you're at the assembly that you should treat people that way, or is that kind of like all the time? That'd be an all the time kind of thing. Um, If you look at 1 Timothy 3.15... Paul says, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the the truth. And so when people will take this verse and say, okay, from this verse, that means that the only thing Paul's talking to Timothy about is just how you manage the assemblies. Household of God, I think, means more than just when we're together at this place that we meet. I think this is how Christians conduct themselves amongst one another. And five... Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 would be an example of that sort of thing. Uh, But go to chapter 2. And look at verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. 
Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves. And uh, the reason that I read the first part of verse 9 as well, in verse 8 when he says, I desire that the men should pray, that Greek word is literally like men, the gender men, not the generic term like mankind. And we can know that even in our English Bibles because of verse 9 when he says, likewise also that women should adorn themselves. And he's going to start talking about what the roles of women would be. Um, And so what do you think he means in this passage when he says, I desire that in every place the men should pray? What does he mean by every place? Yeah, now some people will take this to say, well, that means in every assembly, in every gathering of Christians that the men, but it would be different if you, like, let's say you were at your house and you're having Thanksgiving tomorrow and there was, um, you know, the matriarch of the family and she wants to go ahead and lead the Thanksgiving uh, prayer or something like that. And so the, the every place wouldn't apply in that scenario because he's talking about all the churches and when they meet. What do you guys think about that? I got one woman saying no. Yes. Yes. Um, what, what about, okay, um, what about a husband and wife? If it's just a husband and a wife, can the wife lead a prayer with the husband? Maybe if she's got a head covering in per, per 1 Corinthians 11. But this is, like, it's funny because, like, we'd say, oh, yeah, in every circumstance. But then when it comes to the marriage situation, then there's suddenly diversity of opinions. Um, I don't know that I want to get into all of that. um, But that is something that I think people do need to think about and where they would get authority in the Scripture to think through some of these kinds of things. And so, um, but let's keep looking, though, in this passage in 1 Timothy 2. Let's keep looking in verse 9. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. By the way, would that only apply at the assembly, or do you think that would apply in every context? Every con- yeah, this is not just about the assembly. Verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. There's a ton to say about this passage. Um, We can talk about the modesty thing uh, if we want to in just a little bit, but look at verse 11. What is it that a woman is supposed to do? In 11 and 12? Quietly receive receive instruction. Okay. Now, if I have to let the dogs out, or I have to let a kid have his way and get some candy, the idea of letting something happen means that the person desires it, and there might be forces otherwise against having that happen. He says in verse 11, let a woman learn quietly. All right. Paul's writing to a preacher in the city of Ephesus. What did the city of Ephesus have as far as its pagan worship goes? Artemis Artemis or Diana. And if if you've ever seen images of the sculptings of it, it is very, very sexualized. What was the role of women in religion in that city at that time in history? Prostitution. Uh, Like priestly prostitutes or priestitutes or something. Um, And so... uh, it, the women were looked at as sex objects when it came to their worship. Now here Paul is saying, let women be dignified to learn. That was liberal in that society. That was freeing in that society. That was not something that women got to do when it came to their religion. But yet we look at this today and go, well, that's very, very offensive that that he's saying this, um, but when he says, he says the word quiet again in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. What does that word quiet mean? Go back to verse 1 of this chapter. 
First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This same idea is applied to all Christians in the Roman Empire. What does he mean about Christians having a quiet life? Dignified, like you're praying for the governing officials that they would have wisdom, that they would legislate with godly wisdom. They're not persecuting Christians so that Christians aren't the center of all kinds of like ruckuses happening and riots happening, that the Christians can just quietly do their thing. Does that mean that all Christians can't talk in society? That, that's not what that means. It means that we have got a, the ability before the governing officials to have a respectful demeanor. We're not at conflict with each other. It, that's the idea that he means in verse 2. So when he talks about women learning quietly with all submissiveness, it's this idea that they're not trying to take charge. They're not having a domineering spirit. They're, things like that is the idea. It doesn't mean that they can't ever have an opinion. It doesn't mean that they can't ever share an opinion. But it means that there's not this domineering, like I'm trying to take charge of a position that I don't have. Comments or questions on that? Yes. 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 Yes, and then like Wes said earlier in verse, verses 13 through 15, he talks about, you know, Adam was formed first, then Eve, Adam was not deceived. Have you ever noticed that, by the way, in verse 14, Adam was not deceived? You know that in Genesis 3, Adam was standing there the whole time that Eve was talking to the serpent? And he was not deceived. He knew the whole time that this was wrong, but Eve is giving him the fruit. He's like, okay, why not? Uh... And so, like, he wasn't deceived. She was. She at least thought she was doing something that made sense. And the whole time, he wasn't being a leader, and he wasn't encouraging her to stop this. Ian? Incorrectly in what sense? How would the misuse be? Like, like women can never talk. Like women can never talk. Oh, you mean like in business or... In politics, I would go, yeah, I would go back to chapter 3, verse 15, and it says this is how Christians conduct themselves in the house of God. I, I guess, I guess. Okay. Um, all right, uh, anything else you guys want to say about 1 Timothy 2? Yeah, yeah. this is like the, the one place that you guys, women don't have to worry. And maybe, maybe some of you helped get the Lord's Supper stuff ready or something. But like, as far as like prayers, like you, you can just take in what the Lord wants you to take in that day. Yeah. Right. Yes. 
And um, Sewell Hall, whenever I'd get together with him when I was in Atlanta, he said that he thinks the next thing that's going to divide churches of Christ is going to be uh, male and female roles. That our, our, our culture has become um, thinking that, that if, there, if there's ever a difference in somebody's roles, that that means that there's some kind of inferiority going on. Um, Verse 15 talks about women being saved through childbearing. Our biology teaches us that there's a difference in roles. Uh, breastfeeding, like, like the way that children are nurtured when they're younger. Our biology teaches us that we have different roles. And, um, but anyways, I, I don't want let, to, let's move on to talk about roles women do have, because we had to clear some of those things away. Oftentimes the complaint in a class like this is that we're just talking about what women can't do. I thought we were talking about what women can do. So let's try to spend some time with that. Uh, women can, have, can teach in certain contexts. Uh, in the Bible, there's some female prophets. Uh, you've got Miriam and Deborah, Huldah and Isaiah's wife, uh, Anna in Luke 2, Philip's four virgin daughters that were prophetesses. Can a woman... Teach another man the gospel via, like, conversation. Like, go back and forth in conversation and be taught that way. That's how I was taught the gospel. And so, if that's not allowed, then my conversion wasn't legit or something. Um, and then women teaching women in Titus 3, verses 3 and 4. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. All right, so women that get upset that I can't lead in the public assembly. Nothing's stopping you from going and talking to other women about learning how to love your husbands and children better. Which, by the way, implies that it doesn't always come natural to love your husband or your children. Nothing's stopping you from doing that. Why are you so concerned about something that you might deem a glorious position in a church or something like that? Uh, it, it's not a position of glory. Yeah, Wes? Yes. Right. And I'd say even in Bible classes, like, um, if I, can I say something that might sound mean, but I don't mean it to be mean? Every church I've been at, the women largely are the better Bible students than the men. And so the comments that women give in Bible classes generally teach me more. And I, I, every church I've been to, there's really good men who are really good Bible students. But on the whole, I've known more good Bible students who were women than men. Yeah. They both did it together. Yep. Good. And then when Samantha and I were in California, we did, uh, I mean, we were the best that the church had for this purpose, like premarital counseling. And so we would both sit down with people and talk to them about marriage things that they need to be aware of and whatever. Uh, I don't know that we, we actually probably weren't the best that that church had, but that's what we did sometimes. All right. Um, women are also... Uh, made in God's image like men are and they can let their light shine and you got people like the example of Dorcas there's there's lots of things that all women can do in the Bible and so rather than clamoring and being upset about certain things that you can't do why isn't there more attention given to the things that you can do um, there's certain things that men can't do I couldn't give birth to any of my kids but I know that that's painful and all that sort of thing um, but uh, uh, all right, so that, those are the things that would apply just to, to, to all women. What about women who choose to be married and have kids? Um, the, what the Bible says for women in that situation uh, is to, if you're married, is to bear children, and there's an emphasis on the household. 1 Timothy 2.15, yet she'll be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.14, so I would have the younger widows marry, bear children, and after they marry, look what they're supposed to do. Bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Or Titus 2, verses 4 and 5, train the young women how to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. If you are a single woman, there's a ton of stuff you can do for the Lord. If you choose to be married, do you have the right 
to neglect your children? No. And so, and those are the passages that say those things. Does anybody have any comments that you want to make about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then oftentimes what people will say to something like that is, well, Carrie, don't you want to do something with your life? As if nurturing children, human beings, is unimportant. Like, what is wrong with your perspective? The, like, so many of us can look back at, at our, when we were younger and really appreciate our parents who were there for it. And by the way, husbands can't neglect their kids either. And I, but, but we're looking at passages that say specifically for women who choose to be married and have kids, this is what the Bible says about your responsibilities. Um, does that mean, well, let me, let me bring this up. Okay, uh, the Bible talks about the Proverbs 31 woman does she do work that financially helps the family? Yes, she does. Um, and she's like handcrafting material. She, she works a job, as it were. But even the work that she does in that chapter is not about her escaping the family for a period of time to get self-fulfillment. The work that she even does in that chapter is about the family and doing something to bless the family. And now in our culture, people... I remember when we lived in Atlanta... And I would take the kids to a playground. Uh, whenever I get home from work, I'd take the kids to the playground. And Samantha would get some time just by herself. And whenever our, the kids were at the playground, we'd have like, you know, the, however many kids we had there. And uh, four probably, because that's how many we have now. Um, and they were like all playing around. And there'd be like other moms that would bring their kids to the, to the park. And we, they would start asking me like what I do for work. And like, oh, I'm a teacher, you know. Um, and then, uh, like, well, what does your wife do? And I'm uh, like, oh, she stays at home with the kids. Oh, I can't. The reason that I got a job is so I wouldn't have to deal with them. Like, these are, I'm not saying every mom that works a job where she's not with the kids is doing it for that reason. I'm saying, culturally speaking, these are the kinds of things people hear. But we have to reconcile with what the Bible says about this. And, it, it, well, the Proverbs 31 woman is making money. It's not wrong for a woman to do that. Would it be wrong for a woman to neglect what these passages say? Yes. Now, any thoughts or comments on that? Our culture is also a culture that does not think being with kids is a valuable thing. Our culture says that the way that somebody does something great is by being in an office or running a business or something like that. That's what makes you important. And the kingdom of God always turns the values of the world upside down. And we need to have more men that believe these ideas, and we need to have more women that embrace these ideas. We're going to say something, Cadence? Yeah, in the context of the older women training the young women. Now, I've talked to some older women who have said, I've tried to talk to younger women, and they're really arrogant, and they don't think they can learn anything from me. And so that could be a problem. Like, younger women have to have the humility to actually learn from the older people. But yeah, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. Uh, 
Yes, very good. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is the other side of this. Guys, quit playing, quit being addicted to your video games. Get a job, be responsible, be the kind of guy that a woman would entrust to give your life to uh, so that any, if you, husband, single guys, all right, single guys, if you want a wife like this that is working at home, but you can't even give her a home, You see the problem? I've said this before, but before Adam ever married Eve, what did he have? A job. Work the garden. Oh, here's your wife, by the way. He had a job first. And so men need to be responsible, all that sort of thing. Um, all right, let's say a couple other things about this. All right, look at this question. What influence did, um, did mother and grandmother have on Timothy? What influence did Timothy go on to have? What you guys know from these passages, what is it that um, Lois and Eunice did for Timothy? Do you think Lois and Eunice, when they heard that Timothy was doing good work in Ephesus, were like, you know what, we could have, you know, instead of teaching him, we could have done so much better if we worked like some kind of corporate job, and we kind of wasted a lot of our time investing in Timothy. I don't think they would have had that perspective, but our culture says that that's the trade-off that's worth, that's worth doing. By the way, another thing to consider with all this, the curses in Genesis 3, um, what is the curse to the man? That you're going to work the ground and it's going to bring forth thorn, thor, thorns and thistles. What's the curse to the woman? Pain and childbirth. Which, by the way, I don't think it just means that the act of delivery will hurt more. I think the whole ball of wax of child rearing is going to be difficult. What's the next story? Cain kills Abel. Do you think that hurt Eve and Adam too? But how many infertility stories are there in the book of Genesis? Pain and childbearing. Like there's all kinds. Of, but her desire will be for her husband and then what? He will rule over you. Do, do you see that the curses correspond to the roles? Pain and childbearing for the woman. Like in the home, with the ch children, again, Proverbs 31 shows it doesn't mean that you can't have a job. Don't have your job to the neglect of your children, though, is the idea. So, but the men's curses is, is his work that provides for the family. So the curses correspond to the roles that men and women both have. Comments or questions on that? Yes. I was hoping no one would ask that. Um, so in 1 Timothy 2.15, she'll be saved through childbearing. There's a couple different ways of looking at that. One of, the traditional view of it would be that um, you stay in your lane. Your role is with the children. Um, you focus on what God has given you to do. But then somebody will say, but not all women give birth. Well, then I could go to verse 8 and say, I desire that the men should pray in every place. Does every man lead a public prayer? No, but that's the role given for men, just like childbirth is the role given, given for women. So he's saying, you focus on what God has given you to do, is the idea. Or it could be calling back to the idea that through the pain of childbirth, eventually Jesus came into the world, and that through women, it, salvation has come, um, and women are saved through childbearing. Everybody's saved through the childbearing of what a woman did by bringing Jesus into the world. Um, but that, that gets into a lot of other things. But both of those ideas would be true, I think, though. Yes. By modeling that kind of character. Yes. Right, but her kids might. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes, good. Let me, let me bring up this one other thing here. Um, the Bible does teach that men and women are equally valuable before God. There's different roles, though. Look at, think about this question. 
Jesus and Caiaphas, the high priest at the time Jesus was crucified. Caiaphas was the high priest in the time of Jesus. As the high priest, Caiaphas was able to do many things Jesus could not, like go into the temple on the Day of Atonement. Does that mean that Caiaphas was more important than Jesus? No, different roles do not mean that somebody's more important than somebody else. But biology teaches us that men and women have different roles. And that's something that our culture wants to overthrow and all that kind of stuff. If anybody has any other questions, please talk to somebody or talk to me afterwards. There's a lot of nuances and a lot of um, I don't mean this by that kind of statement that we didn't talk about. Uh, So if anybody has been offended, please talk to me and I'll try to unoffend you if I can.